Uh, let, me, let me pray before we get in the word. God, thank you again that we can just take this time to, to worship you, to in, continue to invite you and your presence into our hearts, Lord, that we, today's a day that we continue to trust you. We continue to say that you're greater than anything that we're facing. God, and I thank you personally that I can be back in this church and that I can be around people who I love and who love us. And uh, God, but as, we, as I share today, Lord, may, may people not be wondering what Devin's going to say, but may your word come forth, God, because we know it's your word that has power. It's your word that brings life transformation. It's your word that we renew our mind on. And so I just pray right now, Holy Spirit, that there would be a specific word for every single person listening online, every single person replaying this, every single person who is here today in person, Lord, that you would have a word for them today and that you would speak to their hearts, their souls, their minds, Father. So I just declare that in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, I don't want to spend too much time on it, but again, just what, it was a great time. Jess and I uh, and my family, as many of you know, just took a little break for a couple weeks, uh, really just spending time as a family, uh, just me and Jess trying to spend time reconnecting and, and time for me to just get into a deeper place of prayer in my own personal life and just recognizing that God has a different place to bring me uh, as a pastor, as your pastor, to, to a place of prayer and a place of his word. It was very refreshing, and I'm very thankful. Um, but, you know, one of the things that God kind of, like, used this for, one of the things that I used it for, I felt like the Lord too, was just kind of wrestling with where I'm at in life. Not where I'm at, like, here in the church, but many of you know I'm, like, smack dab in the middle of my life, right? 43 years old, so a lot of, like, time figuring out, okay, God, what have I done with my life? What does God want me still to do with my life? A lot of time trying to wait and listen to that. And as I was kind of waiting and listening to that, one of the first uh, conferences Jess and I went to, uh, they talked about vision for the middle of your life. And when they talked about vision for the middle of the life, they, they shared this survey that was done um, right around 2010, I think it was, where they surveyed all these different people, all these different nations, age group, economic groups, and they asked people where they were on their quality of life, kind of joy in life, kind of happiness, their well-being, scale one to 10, you know, how happy are you basically? And as you know, this just goes up on the right side, seven to six is where most of it came out at. But, but you know, the, the question was posed to us based on the ages, you know, it starts at 18, it ends at 85, you know, based on ages, where do you think this line ends up when, when we're talking about just happiness and well-being overall? Again, not just in America, but across the nation. And, and I, was, I was thinking that my first first thought was, my, honestly, my first thought was I thought it goes in a hump because I think, you know, people reach the prime of their life, right? And when they reach the prime of their life, they're the most happiest. And in the beginning in college, it can be stressful or after high school, what am I going to do with my life? And, you know, sometimes towards the end of life, we can have some issues we have going on. And then I thought, well, maybe it's a, just a straight line, you know, uh, maybe it's just like people are either happy or they're not. And so it's a straight line for everybody. But here's what we found out, or here's what this research done, and this has been done a couple times, but what has been found out that it's actually U-shaped. Maybe some of you already knew that I was going to say this, but, but it's statistically proven that many people feel less happy about their life, you know, right in the middle of their life, right? It starts very optimistic and idealistic when they're young and, and they have great aspirations of where their life's going to go, you know, and if you're younger in here, it's okay to have those, but it kind of like works its way down, both men and women, right, in that mid-40s and 50s kind of, and then it starts to work its way back up, and as people get older again, they become more you know, optimistic about how things were, or they have more memories. And, and the question is like, why is it, you know, that, that there's this dip? You know, why is it that midlife crisis basically is statistically proven? Why do people struggle with this, right? And, uh, and as we talked around the one round table that we had, and uh, as a lot of different people talked in this conference, you know, one of the things that really came to light is disappointment, is disappointment is that when we kind of come to the middle of our life, we, we hit a lot of disappointment. You know, that when we're younger, we have a lot of thoughts of like, what our life's going to be about, or what our dreams are, and what our hopes for, what we're shooting for, right? And then when we come to the middle of our life, we kind of either recognize that those dreams did happen, and we're kind of disappointed, or maybe they actually did happen, and you got everything you thought you wanted, you got the car, you got the house, you got the job, you got the, the paycheck, you got the, the spouse and two and a half kids or whatever it says to have, right? You got everything you wanted, 
but something still is unsatisfied. And you're still, and they actually say more people are disappointed when they actually obtain what they were chasing after than when they didn't get what they wanted. And this place of disappointment is real sometimes. And, and I know this, this is specific to kind of like a middle life, but today I want to talk to all of us about disappointment because disappointments are real in our life. And, and I hope to encourage you to be thankful in, in disappointment. And the reasons I'm bringing this up is that as we continue to journey through 2020, I mean, is it just me or does 2020 feel like the longest year ever, Right. And I mean, in 2020, I, I believe, will probably be labeled many different things, right? But it's, it's the year of disappointment. I mean, we look back and we think of how we felt in the beginning of the year, 2020 vision, new decade, right? Lots of hopes, right? And, and the word disappointment is when we have this, these feelings of sadness or displeasure that's caused from a non-fulfillment of someone's hope or expectation. You expect something to happen. It doesn't happen, and then we are disappointed, right? If you, if you have kids, you know what I'm talking about, right? Don't get their hopes up too high, right? Because the kids, they're really easy to become disappointed when they get really excited. And, and, and again, on, on this time of sabbatical way, I actually took some time to think about some of my disappointments in life and, and think about and wrestle with some of them. And, and do you mind, church, if I can just be real with you today about some of those? I'd like to just share some of those with you. And as I just were kind of journeying through, you know, like if I got to, if I'm just completely honest with you, I'm obviously wrestling through and disappointed that, you know, every time I forget my mask at home or I got to, you know, I forget my mask in the car and, you know, oh, I got to, can't leave my house without a mask. You know, there's just personally, I'm not talking about being safe. I want to be safe for people, but personally, I'm like, oh, right? I mean, wrestling with disappointment, right, that, that I didn't get to have a normal Thanksgiving with my side of the family just because of my dad's health and just my sister's out of state, some different things. And I was, I was disappointed by that. Uh, disappointed that my, my father had to go through what he's had to go through. You know, many of you know he went through a very hard surgery. He's recovering, praise God. I believe he's rebounding, going to be 100%. But, you know, still as a family, and me personally, it, it's been disappointing that I had to see my father go through him, through that, that I love very much. You know, disappointed, right, that, that when I look at this year, that back in May we lost Joanne Groover, you know, who has just been a rock in our church. And, and then to come and find out that the Lord took Elaine home. And for me, that, that was disappointing. You know, it was disappointing just because I'm like, man, why, Lord? You know, I'm, I'm so thankful that Elaine's with the Lord. We know that, right? But I'll tell you one thing. When I think about it, and I, I pray and hope that, you know, working with the family, we're going to have a time to celebrate her life soon. We're trying to work that out. But let me just say real quick. I mean, Elaine was one of the kindest, most humble, most selfless, spiritually passionate childlike heart person I knew. And I was so disappointed to come back. I, we heard right when it happened, but just coming back, I was like, oh, I got to go back. And Elaine's not going to be in staff meeting. Elaine's not going to be there smiling and cheering me up and always just in my corner, whatever you need, Pastor Devin. You know, and, and you know what? I thank God. Many of you heard she was in her prayer chair. There was no sign of struggle. She died peacefully. The Lord just took her like Elijah, right? She worked on Tuesday. She went to be with the Lord on Wednesday. But me personally, Jess, some of you here, right? It's disappointed, right? And, uh, and, and I'm, I'm a guy, too, that, like, I just put high standards on myself and on people around me. So guess what? I have been disappointed with coworkers. When I was a youth pastor, I'd be disappointed with teens sometimes. Sometimes I've been disappointed with my kids when I shouldn't be, but I am been disappointed in my wife, which I'm sorry for. And most importantly, I'm disappointed with myself, right? Because I set this huge high standard, right, for myself. And, and what about you? Am I, am I the only one that sometimes wrestles with this? Maybe you wrestle in some way, right? Maybe it's it's a career situation, or maybe it's a family situation, or maybe you're disappointed with your spouse, or maybe you're disappointed how people treat other people in our nation or around us, or maybe you're disappointed by the outcome of the election, right? And you're just not what you thought, or maybe you aren't disappointed with the outcome of the election, but let me tell you, I've had, I've not been disappointed with the outcome of an election, and then later, three months, six months, a year later, been disappointed by the people that I voted for, and they didn't do what they said, right? I mean, 
We're all going to be disappointed by this election some way, somehow, right? Because that's just how it is, right? We wrestle with it. Listen, some of us, we are just disappointed. This COVID thing, remember when COVID was supposed to be kids home for two weeks from school? And then all of a sudden it was like eight weeks. And then all of a sudden it was like May. And we're like, oh my goodness, May. And then all of a sudden it was September, right? Oh, once September comes, we'll be over this, right? And then remember when it was like, it's just when we pass the election, then it'll be over, Right? And then remember now, it's like, you know, it's just like disappointment after disappointment with this, right? We keep expecting something to change. And then listen, if that's not bad enough, how about our football team? Oh my goodness, right? Not just our football team, any Dallas Cowboy fans out there. Thank you, Chris. You're disappointed too, right? We're all just in the disappointment boat together, aren't we? Right? And so now you might be saying, wow, Devin, I'm so thankful you came back so happy. You might be saying, Tevin, why are you coming back on a downer? Listen, let me just say, uh, and, and I didn't say it publicly yet. Thank you so much, Pastor Clay. Thank you, Pastor Scott, Aaron, Steve, others who spoke here. Great words. You know, just hear, just recently heard Aaron's message and, and Clay, so they're ringing in my ear. But I'm so thankful for what Aaron said a couple weeks ago that we don't build our life on our feelings. We build our life on the truth of God's word. I'm so thankful for what Clay said last week that we vote for joy. We choose every day to say, I am going to have joy. Today is a day that the Lord has made and I can rejoice in it, right? Because of what Jesus has done for us. But that doesn't mean that we can never allow the true feelings that happen in our heart and be okay with talking about it. Do you know that? It doesn't mean we just have to avoid it completely. And I'm an avoider of my feelings sometimes, church. It doesn't mean we have to do that. Can I tell you, there are many stories of disappointments in the Bible by godly people. Right? Abraham and Sarah, they were disappointed for many years that they couldn't have a child. Right? How about Job sitting there lamenting in disappointment when he lost everything and even his health? Right? How about, how about Samuel when he was disappointed in King Saul? Right? In the actions of King Saul, how he disobeyed God. How about Nehemiah when he was disappointed when he wept? He heard about the state of Jerusalem and the state of the wall. And when he heard about the destruction of the wall and how it wasn't rebuilt, he says he went and he wept and, and fasted. Right? He was, he was broken. And, and come on, how about Jesus? Even Jesus was wrestled with disappointment. Remember when his disciples wouldn't have faith and they, they were scared? And he goes, how much longer do I have to put up with you? Right? Where's your faith at? Listen, disappointment is real. And today, as I want to encourage us through moments of disappointment, I want to look at a story in the Bible uh, in 2 Kings as we look at the story of Hezekiah. So if you have your Bibles with you today, uh, you can turn to 2 Kings as we all kind of wrestle with this. Uh, and we're going to look at the story of Hezekiah. And uh, so 2 Kings 18 and 19, if you want to follow along, I'm going to give you a couple cliff notes. We're not going to read the whole story. I encourage you, take a moment, take an take a hour and read through 18 and 19, an amazing story. When you're struggling in your faith, pull out 2 Kings 18 and 19 and read it of the strength and the power of God. We're going to read that today. Also, 2 Chronicles also details Hezekiah's life, and so I'll refer to a couple things that Second Chronicles says, but, but mainly we'll be in Second Kings here. And uh, listen, I put this picture up on the screen. This is an actual real artifact. It's actually a seal that kings would seal their letters with. It's called a bula. And uh, it was found in 2015 and believes to belong to King Hezekiah. And it was found right near the Temple Mount in Jerusalem as different... Um, uh, archaeologists, uh, you know, did um, diggings there and, and found it. And, and you might say, well, how do we know it's really King Hezekiah, right? Well, we know it's King Hezekiah because it literally says in Hebrew there, belonging to Hezekiah, son of Ahaz, king of Judah, right? And, and I think it's incredible when, you, when we sometimes read these stories in the Old Testament, we cannot connect the dots that these are real stories by real people where God moved in their life. And really, King Hezekiah is one of the kings of Israel, I mean of Judah, forgive me, that there's the most artifacts found if you just do some research. And, and so I, just a little word, a little picture there to remind us this is a real story that happened and should encourage our hearts as we read it. Okay, listen, his father, as it's mentioned here, Ahaz, not a righteous man. He did not obey 
God. Wanted no part of following him. And because of that, God allowed Ahaz to be defeated by many nations. Uh, Ahaz took the uh, approach that, hey, if, if, we get, if we can't beat him, join him. So Ahaz started worshiping the gods of the other nations that he was defeated by, hoping that he would be saved. He didn't realize it was his own disobedience that caused him to be defeated, that he disobeyed the Lord God Almighty. Uh, but sadly, he even shut down all the temple worship. No more sacrifice, no more priests, right? No more Passover celebrations. Completely shut down the temple. And he died at a young age. God pulled him out, basically, raised up Hezekiah, his son, who was 25 when he became uh, king of Judah. And God stirred the heart of King Hezekiah. And Hezekiah knew that he needed to trust in the Lord. Hezekiah opened up the temples, started training priests again, went back to the Old Testament. Let's redo a training on how to worship the Lord and, and put God where he belonged. And this is what it says of Hezekiah, because Hezekiah is going to be our God for today. This is what it says about Hezekiah. It says this, and this is a verse, uh, chapter 18, 5 through 8 in 2 Kings. It says, Hezekiah, he trusted the Lord, the God of Israel, so that there was none like him among all the kings of Judah after him, nor among those who were before him. For he held fast to the Lord. He did not depart from following him, but kept the commandments that the Lord commanded Moses. And the Lord was with him. Listen, Wherever he went out, he prospered. He rebelled against the king of Assyria and would not serve him. He struck down the Philistines as far as Gaza and the territory and from watchtower to fortified cities. Listen, when I hear that, I think, man, sometimes it is good to serve the Lord, right? It's great. God just brings favor and prosper and blessing. And that's what he was doing in Hezekiah's life because Hezekiah made some really hard decisions to say, we're getting rid of all these idols. We're going to put God back where he belongs. We're going to worship him. And the Lord was with Hezekiah, right? And, and where Ahaz formed an alliance with Assyria because Ahaz was scared of the Assyrians, Hezekiah's like, we're not going to have any alliance with this pagan nation. No way. It's done, right? And so all things are good, right? All things are good. And when things are good, you start hoping that things are just going to continue to go good. We start having expectations. Hey, everything's going to be wonderful forever. God must surely bless me and our nation, and we're going to just live in a time of peace and prosperity. But for some of you who know, know the story, it later goes to say that in the 14th year of King Hezekiah, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came against all the fortified cities of Judah and took them. That the Assyrian king did not just walk away, but he's like, no, I'm coming back and I'm going to take some of the things that were told that I could have. So Sennacherib, okay, not too hard. Just think snacking on a rib, right? This is the name of the king of the Assyrians, right? And, and so all of a sudden, can you imagine King Hezekiah, right, sitting in his throne room or wherever he was, words of disappointment over and over again. The Assyrians attack this city in Judah. The Assyrians attack this city in Judah, right? And then all of a sudden, the Assyrian army, over 200,000 most likely, came and surrounded Jerusalem. Sennacherib's, you know, messengers started shouting insults to the people in Jerusalem, started threatening war, started mocking them so badly they literally said, hey, we'll even give you 2,000 horses. You couldn't even beat us if we gave you our horses to fight on. You guys have nothing. Started shouting about how they defeated every other nation's God, and your God is not like that at all. And, and, and literally start with speaking in the Hebrew language to the people in Jerusalem saying, hey, if you stay in the city, you're going to die. But hey, if you leave Hezekiah, you come follow the Assyrians, we'll keep you safe. We'll keep you safe, right? But if you stay in the city, you're going to die. Can you imagine the pressure and the disappointment that Hezekiah was going through in that moment? Right? And as he continued on, he got a handwritten scroll, letter, whatever it was, right, from the Assyrians, from Sennacherib and his messenger. And he just continued to kind of like, just like stick it to him. 
And he says this, he says, he's talking to Hezekiah, he says, do not let your God in whom you trust deceive you by promising that Jerusalem will not be given into the hand of King Assyria. He says, behold, you have heard what the kings of Assyria have done to all the land, devoting them to destruction, and shall you be delivered? And he goes on to list in the letter, nation after nation after nation that they defeated, and king after king after king that they defeated killed. And he's like, you're, gonna, you're just next on the list. And all of a sudden, can you imagine being in charge of all these people, being surrounded by a huge army, have, being taunted, mocking their, our God, saying our God's going to deceive us, telling our people to revolt against us. Can you imagine just how disappointed? Can you imagine maybe even Hezekiah thinking, God, where are you? I thought you were with me. I thought I did everything you wanted to. Where are you? And, and, and can you imagine just the pressure that, that he probably felt to just feel completely hopeless? See, I, I believe if, if, if disappointment is when our expectations don't turn out like they should, disappointment can also lead to hopelessness, right? We have to be careful because when we hope, we're, we're expecting something else good to happen, right? Isn't that what hope is? We, we hope that something good, we didn't see it yet, we didn't obtain it yet, but we're hoping it's going to turn out. But see, when we, when we have disappointment in one area of our life, it's like a domino effect sometimes. All of a sudden, all this hopelessness can come pouring into our life. And it, it was very easy for Hezekiah to just become hopeless in this situation. You know what? Hezekiah's dad, Ahaz, the wicked king, he would have been hopeless. Hezekiah's dad would have, would have turned his back, and, and that's what he did. He turned away from God, but not Hezekiah. And so as we read this story, what did Hezekiah do in this, this just time of disappointment? It says that he took that letter, he took that scroll that, that, that the Assyrians gave to him, mocking God. And it says Hezekiah received a letter from the hand of the messengers. He read it. He didn't avoid it. He didn't run from it. He read it. And it says, Hezekiah went up to the house of the Lord and he spread it before the Lord. I love that picture. I love just thinking of Hezekiah just undoing the scroll and setting it on the altar of the Lord. I can just imagine him either walking away or kneeling down, right? And just saying, God, here's the letter. Here's my disappointment. Here's my issues. Here's what I'm facing right now. And I'm just going to set it before the Lord. And Hezekiah prays a prayer that just, it needs to be part of our prayer life. He says this, he says, says, Hezekiah prayed before the Lord, O Lord, the God of Israel, a throne above the cherubim, which are angels, you are the God, you alone of all the kingdoms of the earth, you have made heaven and earth. So incline your ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see. Hear the words of Sennacherib, which he has sent to mock the living God. Truly our Lord, the king of Assyria, has laid waste to the nations of their lands, and they have cast their gods into the fire. For they were not gods, but the work of men's hands, wood and stone. Therefore they were destroyed. So now, O Lord, our God, save us, please, from his hand that all the kingdoms on earth may know that you, O Lord, are God alone. That you, O Lord, are God alone. Listen, as I read Hezekiah's response, I just want to encourage us a couple things that we can apply to our life and our issues sometimes that we face. Number one, I want to say this. Can I encourage you, please be real about your disappointments in your life. Be real about them, right? Right? Listen, there's nothing that you're wrestling with that God can handle. There's nothing that you're wrestling with that God is surprised by, right? We can be real about it. We don't build our life on these emotions. We don't let it guide our life. Listen, we can still choose joy every single day. We're called to wake up and say, God, I'm gonna have your joy in my heart. But that does not mean we can't be real about some of the feelings that are in our hearts and be disappointed by them, right? It's okay. And this is the thing that I love when he lays this letter out before God on the altar, right? He's basically saying, God, I'm just being real with what I'm facing here, right? And sometimes that's what we need to do. We just need to say, God, here's the, here's the attack. Here's the word against us. God, he is right. He did defeat this army and this army and this army and this nation and this nation. He did kill this king and this king and this king. So God, I'm just going to lay it out in front of you. 
And I'm going to be real with what I have going on in my heart and life. And I think there's a place for us to be real. You know what? Maybe some of you aren't wrestling with disappointments today. And if not, praise the Lord. And I'm thankful. But maybe there's some of you today that you are wrestling with some disappointments in your life. Maybe it's something little. Maybe it's something recent. Maybe it's something for the last six months. Maybe it's something for the last 10 years. Can I encourage you to do something? Can you do an exercise with me? Can you grab your bulletin if you have it or a piece of paper or something? Can you, can you grab something real quick? Can you grab a pen? And, uh, and uh, Matt Degler, can I call on you, buddy? Can you go back and grab those pens in the back if you don't mind? Listen, if you don't have a pen, can you, can you raise your hand real quick and say, hey, I could use a pen? Because this is what I want you to do. I want you to write a little T. Listen, on the back of your bulletin or something or a place you know it, if you're watching online, grab a notebook, if you, you know, grab a pen, get up right now, quick, grab a pen, it's all good. But um, listen, raise your hand high if you need a pen. Matt's coming around. We're going we're gonna to just, just go with me, okay? First Sunday back, right? Just, just go with me on this, okay? Please. And, uh, and uh, as, as you write this T out and just write disappointments at the top and leave a little space above where that's at. But, um, but listen, I just want to encourage you to just write down a couple things that you wrestle with some disappointments in your life. You know, maybe, like I said, they, they might be really small. Maybe it's a disappointed in somebody who's in your life. Maybe, maybe it's disappointed in a job situation. Maybe it's, it's, it's just what we're going through as a nation. But maybe we can just be real here for a moment and just list them out because guess what? God's not afraid of these disappointments that we're wrestling through, okay? Listen, I, I wanna continue to encourage us to be an authentic church. Right? I mean, how many of you, we want to be a real church of real people, right? We will not be able to do that if we hide some of the things that we're going through. If we just put on a smile and say, oh, everything's great. Listen, when we do that, we're lying to other people and we lie to ourselves. In the church world, that's called being a hypocrite. And I just continue, one of the things I prayed about, Lord, continue to help us to be an authentic church who truly loves one another and can be real with what is going on in our life. And, and, and I just see Hezekiah, he was not afraid to be real with God about his disappointment. And I encourage you just in this moment, just take a moment, write down a couple things. Are you writing anything down? Are you writing anything down? Hopefully. Listen, if you, if you have no disappointment, just say, no disappointments, God is good. Amen. Praise God. I'm glad, I'm glad where you're at. Listen, second thing that I see him do, and you can keep writing if you still are, but listen, we don't just, we don't, don't just be real about our disappointments, but here, here's where we go. Listen, we keep God above your disappointments and put God above your disappointments. Maybe for the first time, you know what? I'm not gonna, I'm gonna bring God and place him, keep him above your disappointments. Maybe at the top of that, you wanna just write G-O-D. Why do I say keep God above your disappointments? Because I love what Hezekiah prayed here. He prayed, he said, oh Lord, the God of Israel, you're enthroned above the angels, right? He didn't just say, you're enthroned above Judah. He didn't say, you're enthroned above Assyria. He said, you're enthroned above the angels, above earth, above all the kingdoms of the earth, above the heavens. You're above it all, right? And that just brings so much reminder to us. Listen, God is not to blame because of your disappointments. God is not shocked by your disappointments. God is not removed from your disappointments. God is not held powerless because of your disappointments. God is not distant from you because of your disappointments. God is above your disappointments. That is where he belongs, above it all, right? Just like Hezekiah prayed, God just sit and throne above it all. And that it reminds us, right? We let it sink into our hearts of who he is and where, where he belongs. Do you know that when God later spoke to the prophet Isaiah to give a word to Hezekiah about the situation, that God spoke a specific word to King Sennacherib? And the word that he spoke to King Sennacherib, he, he, God speaking through Isaiah, he says, but have you not heard, Sennacherib, that I decided long ago. I planned it, and now I am making it happen. I planned that you crush those other cities and other nations into heaps of rubble. That is why their people had so little power, and they were frightened and confused. Basically, I allowed you to take your place. You didn't do it, Sennacherib. And he goes on and basically says, and as quickly as I've pulled you up, it's a quickly I'm taking you down. Because God is above it all. Listen, keep God above your disappointments. So first we, we just are real about them, and then we just put God above them. 
And then what we need to do is say, God, give me strength to rely on faith, to walk through our disappointments, right? We need to rely on faith to walk through our disappointments. I mean, uh, what did Hezekiah do? As soon as he heard all these disappointing words and as soon as this letter came to him, what did Hezekiah do? Did he say, let's round up the troops, everybody? Did he say, where are my advisors at? Did he say, you know, hey, we have to give orders and, and figure out what's gonna happen here. We gotta, no, what did he do? Right, did he go in a corner and suck his thumb and oh, what am I gonna do? No, he relied on his faith. And he went, the first thing he did was he went before the Lord and trusted in God. And basically as he prayed, he said, now Lord, save us. Right, this plea, save us, right? This cry to God, save us. God, God, I'm, I'm trusting in you. Nothing else is going to work. So God, I'm just coming to you. I'm putting my faith in you. Would you please save me from what is coming? And may they know that you are God. Listen, faith causes us not to follow man's plans. Faith causes us not to follow the fear of man. Faith causes us to open our ears, to be desperate to hear what God is saying so that we can walk in where he wants us to go. I encourage today, just even as we wrestle with disappointments, it's a place where as I was wrestling with my disappointments in some areas, I said, Lord, stir faith up. Stir faith up in my heart. Give me more faith, right? Listen, I, the three areas that I've been praying for more faith, I want greater belief in the love of God, I want greater belief in the power of God, and I want greater belief in the promises of God. That's what I've been praying personally through these last couple of weeks in my life. Give me greater belief. Andrew Murray, he said this, he said, unbelief is the mother of all disobedience. And it hit me like a rock. Lord, strengthen my faith that I might believe that you are the Lord above it all and that you will walk me through whatever disappointment is in my life. And so let me finish the story. Some of you know how this story works. Some of you don't. If you don't, I'm really excited to tell you. Because here's Hezekiah. He's surrounded. He's being taunted. People are being tempted to leave him. Right? They're all being quiet. As Hezekiah goes. He lays out the word of his enemy in front of the, in, to the altar. He basically just said, cries out to the Lord, save me. And then all of a sudden, God gives a word to the prophet Isaiah. The prophet Isaiah comes and speaks to Hezekiah, who, by the way, in 2015, when they found that seal of Hezekiah, do you know that three years later, in the same vicinity, they found another seal or bula that says prophet of Isaiah? In the same area, because prophet Isaiah and Hezekiah worked together so much. And it's, of course, it was in the same area, just proof and proof that these are not fake stories. This is historic, in God, the work of God. And... Uh, and here's what the prophet Isaiah just simply said to Hezekiah. He says this. He says, this is now what the Lord says about the king of Assyria. His armies will not enter Jerusalem. They will not even shoot an arrow at it. They will not march outside its gates with their shield, nor build the bank of the earth against the walls. The king will return to his own country by the same road in which he came. He will not enter the city, says the Lord, for my own honor and for the sake of my servant David, right? I will defend this city and protect it. As Hezekiah just held on and relied on the, his faith in God. God speaks this promise, right? And let me tell you, this is an incredible and insane promise of God, right? I mean, we struggle to believe it, right? Sometimes we hear the, what God says and we're like, God, can you really do that? I mean, there's over 200,000 people that they believe were in his army at that time, right? I mean, that's like three football stadiums filled with army men that are surrounding them. And God says, oh, by the way, they're not even going to step foot in the city, right? It seems crazy. I remember just real quick when the Lord promised that when we were in our old building that the Lord was going to provide every dollar for our first heater. Remember that? And we were in a prayer meeting. The Lord just spoke that word and we're like, how's that going to happen? And the Lord did it, right? Because that's what the Lord does, right? When he speaks something. And so the Lord said, listen, it's not going to be like other ways. I'm not going to call you to go out and fight and, and the Lord's going to be with you. I'm not going to say, go out and fight and, and wait till you see the wind, the rustling in the leaves, and the Lord's going to go before you and, and beat them. The Lord didn't say, go put your worshipers out in front and, and then and worship the Lord, and then I'm going to defeat you. He says, just sit there and be still, and I'm going to take care of it. That's what the Lord said. 
And I love because when you read these two chapters in 2 Kings 18 and 19, you read all these details and all the taunting and all the smack talk and all the, the prayer, right? And, and all of a sudden you just come to the end and you just read one verse. And it just says, that night the angel of the Lord went out to the Assyrian camp and killed 185,000 Assyrian soldiers. And when the surviving Assyrians woke up the next morning, they found corpses everywhere. Boom, right? Listen, one word from the Lord sending how many angels? One angel. That's all he needed to just wipe out the majority of the army. And the remaining ones, they all woke up. Why is everybody dead? And they all fled home, right? I mean, it's an incredible story of the power of God. And as we rely on our faith and trust in our faith, trust me, we need to then come to a place where we can rest in his promises, as we wait for deliverance. Listen, God was faithful in the promise then. God's going to be faithful in his promises to us now. We just have to wait and say, God, would you please be the one to deliver me from whatever disappointment I'm wrestling through? God, would you be the deliverer and the lifter of my head? Worship team, you can come forward. I don't know about you, but I'm amazed, right? I read these stories. I'm amazed. Lord, what God can do. And sometimes we just need to just come to him. We just need to be real, right, about what we're going through. We need to lift him above it all. We need to just say, God, stir up my faith to trust, and then I am going to rest in the promises of God that he is going to bring me through my time of disappointment. Do you guys know that we're entering a season of disappointment right now? When I say season of disappointment, I mean literally we're entering winter, are we not? Do you guys know that winter is like the season of disappointment? Now, when I say that, I know some of you love winter and we love Christmas and some of you, some of you love snow, right? Some, some of you think you're crazy if you love snow, but I'm kind of one of those guys. I like snow, right? So, so why are you calling winter a dis- season of disappointment? It's a season of disappointment because everything dies, doesn't it? It's a season of disappointment because it gets cold. It gets darker quicker. Things that once were blooming and once had life is now dead. Right? And, and trees are barren and there are no more leaves on the trees and, and it just seems hollow and empty around us. And we kind of come into the season of winter and, and it's very easy to feel despair, right? However, we know what happens after winter. What happens after winter? Springtime comes, right? And a new fresh season comes. Fresh season of life, fresh season of growth. And when winter comes now, come on, we, we're so used to it. When winter comes now, we don't freak out, do we? We're like, oh, get the snow shovels out, right? Oh, rake the leaves up quick, right? Because winter's coming, right? Get the coats out. But don't worry. Season of springtime is coming. Season of springtime is coming. For some of us today, as we're wrestling with disappointments, and maybe it's just in our culture as a whole, maybe it's just personally in your life, Maybe it's just for one person in this room who's really struggling with a strong disappointment. And let me just tell you, church, if this message is for one person in this room, God loves you so much and wants to tell you this because he cares for you. And we're all here to support you and walk alongside of you in your season of disappointment. And we want you to know you're not alone. Maybe someone online here that that you're watching and you're you're just been home and by yourself and it's just been a season of disappointment. We want you to know we care. We want you to know you're not alone. But God's going to bring springtime again. And we can rest in God's promises again. You know, I think of one more story as we close. No greater person ever walked this earth than Jesus Christ. Amen? No greater person ever walked this earth than Jesus Christ. And you know what? Jesus Christ is not the greatest person who walked this earth because he taught these amazing messages. He wasn't the greatest because just because he loved people in a way that we couldn't love. He wasn't the greatest just because he did amazing miracles and blew everybody away. Listen, Jesus Christ was the greatest person who ever lived because he not only did it, but he predicted three times that he was going to be taken away, crucified, buried, and then rise again. And he did that, right? He was taken, crucified, buried, and he rose again. And in that season when he was buried and in the tomb, right, what did his disciples do? They were all disappointed, were they not? I just spent three years of my life following this guy, right? What happened? They were wrestling with disappointment. 
Remember those two men? They were, they were walking outside of Jerusalem seven miles on the road to Emmaus, right? If you look in Luke 24, they're, they were sad. Their heads were hanging down low. And Jesus comes up to them, right, after he rose again, after he did what he promised, right? Were they resting in his promises? No. They were sad and disappointed. And Jesus comes up, and they don't know that it's Jesus. And they're like, hey, what are you guys talking about? And they start, did you not hear what happened in Jerusalem? Where have you been, right? And, and, and Jesus is just real and open as he listens to them share their disappointments. Jesus wasn't scared. Jesus didn't freak out. He just listens. He just listens. He just listens. Because Jesus loves, and he loves, and he loves, and he loves you, and he loves me. And he cares for what we're going through. And you know what, as, as he just continues to listen, he finally shares, he says, well, didn't God's word say back here that this was gonna happen? And this, didn't it say this about the Messiah? And didn't it say that he was gonna die and rise again? Didn't you say that, right? And as he reminded him of the promises of God, his, their eyes were opened and they saw Jesus and their heart burned with fire. And today, church, my desire is that we rest in his promises through seasons of disappointment, seasons of challenge, seasons of, of some of us just confused, what's going on. We rest in his promises. And we say, God, would you just continue to open my eyes that your word might burn in my heart. I am so thankful that God's love never disappoints. I'm so thankful his grace never disappoints. I'm so thankful that his power never disappoints. And I'm thankful that his promises never disappoint. So what I want you to do right now, if you could grab that paper one more time, and could you do this with me? Could you just write on the other side of that little T-chart, could you just write God's faithfulness? And again, if you're home watching online, we encourage you to do this from home, but can you just write some ways that God has been faithful? Maybe you want to write a promise that you know that is true in God's word, but you're wrestling with because of your disappointment. Maybe you want to just write down a way that you've seen the faithfulness of God in your life. Listen, we were real about our disappointments, but you know what? We can be real about the faithfulness of God and about the good things that he's done in our life, right? Maybe you just want to write down, Jesus rose again, right? I mean, Great is his faithfulness for that alone. That alone should give us hope in times of disappointment. And so I encourage you just to take a moment and just to write down just some, a couple things of, of ways God has been faithful or a couple promises of God's faithfulness. Can you do that today? And, and listen, as, as some do that, maybe you're here today and, and maybe you're listening and, and, and maybe you're just, the, the truth of what you're thinking is, I'm the disappointment. I've failed, I've walked away. I haven't been like Hezekiah. I haven't been good and godly in God's sight. I have no hope, I'm, I'm, I'm the issue. Maybe there's somebody who feels that today and I wanna give you hope and remind you that listen, Jesus Christ died not when we did everything we should have for him. He died in our deepest place of disappointment. Romans 5, 8, that when we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And today, I wanna remind you that if you reach out and turn your heart and believe in Jesus Christ, that you can, he'll welcome you into his kingdom. That as we, we bring even our own failures to him, he's not afraid of it. And we just surrender even ourselves to him today. Will you stand with us as we close today? Grab a hold of that paper as we close today, because I wanna, I wanna encourage us to just lay this paper out before the Lord maybe not physically here on this altar, but just in our hearts and just maybe even in our hands, that we can just lay it out before the Lord. We can just know that God's not shocked by some of the things we're disappointed by. But we also lay out the fact that we know that God is faithful and that we can cling to that in this time. And I want us to move us to just take a moment to pray to surrender to the Lord. Can we do that? Can we bow our heads? Jesus. Jesus. Jesus, we come to you right now. We come to you right now, Lord. Lord, we bring our disappointments to you. Lord, we bring some of the ways that 
we had different expectations for our life, different expectations for our families, different expectations for ourselves. God, and we're sorry. Lord, we're sorry that we've allowed our disappointment sometimes to even control us. So Lord, we're gonna surrender our disappointments to you right now. We're gonna do what Hezekiah did. We're gonna just, we're just laying them out before you. You see what's written on this paper. More importantly, you see what's written on my heart. But God, we're also gonna place you above our disappointments. And God, we're just gonna declare that you are good and we're gonna renew our faith in you right now. We trust in you, oh God. We cling to you, oh God, today. Lord, we cling to you, we hold fast to you. Lord, we cling to you like holding on to the, the altar, God. We will not let go of you, God, right now. Lord, stir our faith up today in you again. Lord, help us to see, Lord, your power. Help us to see your, your love. Help us to see the truth of your promises, Lord, that not one of your words will ever fail, God. So, Lord, we just declare your good here in this place, and we just say, you are above it all, God. You're above every single thing written down here. You're above it all, God. And Father, where it seems like there's death, Lord, as there seems, seems where there's just this dormant, like a winter time, God, we're believing, Lord, that you are gonna bring springtime in and through our lives today. Father, maybe some of that's gonna come immediately. Maybe some of that's gonna come in a season as we just wait. But God, we are praying that you would bring us through this season, Father, and we're praying, Lord that we will just see the, the mighty hand. Lord, just like Hezekiah prayed, that everyone would know that you are the Lord God. Father, everywhere we go, we would declare that you are the Lord God. Father, if there's anybody here in this room that doesn't know you, Lord, we pray that you would draw them to you in a mighty way. God, that you would show them your love, show them that you haven't turned from them, show them that you haven't run away from them, that you are there. God, so we turn our hearts to you, Lord. I pray for the person that just been turning their heart away from you, Lord, that they've been allowing their disappointments and their discouragement to turn their heart away from you. Lord, I, I, I just say in Jesus' name, Lord, that they'd be free to, to be, run back to you, God, and that you would hold them and comfort them and be with them and listen to them, God, and that they would see you deliver them, Father, from their situation, Father, and that they would build their life on your word that never changes. Thank you.